uh, manages Chicory Week and has been really instrumental in the work um, taking place around this around the Pacific Northwest when it comes to radicchio. And we're going to be hearing more about that today. This was um, in Portland at the Culinary Breeding Network's Variety Showcase event. So just a little bit about uh, the overview for today. We are going to talk just a little bit about the food systems program in the hub. Uh, we have an exciting announcement to make about a specialty crop block grant uh, program uh, proposal. And then we're gonna hear uh, specifically from Lane uh, about the Culinary Breeding Network and their programs. And then we'll have time to share as well. I just wanna welcome everyone. Uh, please introduce yourself in the Zoom chat box. Uh, let us know who you are, where you're located, and what you do. Um, please also use the chat box to ask questions, share links, resources, upcoming events, um, anything else that you feel it would be relevant for uh, the Food Systems Program and the Hub. So a little bit about the Food Systems Program. I'm joined today by Nicole Witham, who's our statewide coordinator, and Ava Kaiser, who is our program manager, and Tia Taylor, who's our office a coordinator. We make up the core office team of the program. Uh, we have a large team of faculty and staff and external partners, many of, uh, of who um, are you who participate in these calls. Um, and so uh, we seek to work with communities throughout the state to foster viable farm businesses, optimize sustainable natural resource stewardship, and to promote scaled processing and distribution, always in the pursuit of access to healthy food for all. Um, and you can see here our seven focus areas. So we were the small farms team and um, over the last uh, three to four years have transitioned into uh, the food systems program. Uh, we represent uh, communities across the state in terms of the work that we do uh, through extension offices in 39 of the counties and on the Colville reservation. Um, and then we also have uh, partners at research and extension centers as well as at our campuses. So a little bit about the Food Systems Hub. This was started back in March uh, to really address problems, uh, uh, issues, uh, try to um, convene uh, folks across the Washington food system to talk about resources specifically re related to COVID-19. Um, you can hear my uh, son's parakeet in the background. Sorry about that. He's uh, providing some background music. And so uh, these hub calls uh, have really evolved into looking at uh, resources in general to support Washingtonians um, across the food system. So we use this to provide a space to connect regularly with WSU and external partners uh, to collect and update resources related specifically to COVID still. So that is still a primary function of this work, um, updating our website with those resources as well as our calendar of events and to provide time and share space um, uh, to connect with one another. So this is just a screenshot of our calendar of events page on our website. I encourage you all to visit it and share resources that you want to see posted there. Um, we have some really exciting upcoming events uh, within the program as well. So I wanted to just give a plug for the Farm Walk series. I know Nicole's on the call and we've just started doing interviews for the podcast. So Nicole, um, do you want to take a minute just to up update everyone on what's going on with Farm Walks? Yeah, hi everybody. We're um, myself and partners at Tilt Alliance, uh, Aaron Murphy and Terry Rokusen, have been hard at work pivoting the Farm Walk series, uh, which is normally a farmer to farmer educational program that happens on farms throughout the state that are focused on um, organic, sustainable, bio intensive. Um, you name it, uh, type of farming, all kinds of different production practices. And this year uh, we have chosen to go to an audio format so that our farmer audience is able to just plug in wherever they are um, and listen to our episodes. We're gonna be launching, um, or I should say airing the episodes this winter. We are going through all of our interviews right now and keep your eye out for a, um, a new farmwalks.org webpage, which will be hosting all of our historical information, galleries, photos, farm walk booklets, and um, of course the new podcast series. So um, also we are gonna be fielding questions and questions that are in particular aimed at farmers. So we'll have an ask a farmer zone where you can um, 
plug in kind of some questions that you have about any sort of production system or management um, tactic. And we are gonna be using those to create our interviews. Um, so yeah, stay, stay plugged in. And if you're on either the Tilt Alliance uh, email list or our WFFR list, you will be sure to see when it's launched. Great, thanks, Nicole. Um, and then we also have Cultivating Success coming up and I wanted to just put a plug in for that as well. Um, and I know we have both Abba and Nicole on the call who've been um, helping to bring this program forward. So I'll let them share. I, I know I had reached out to Abba because I wasn't sure, Nicole, if you'd be available. So either one of you can, can join in and, and share some information about this upcoming program. Yeah, Nicole, do you want to take it away? I'll, I'll take it. You, you've got the radicchio thing going on today. So um, on brand. yeah, I'll, I'll take this one. Stay on brand. Exactly. Um, so another program that we're really excited about our cultivating success program, which is it's in its 20th year. Uh, it's a small, uh, small farms educational curricula. And we have our whole farm planning class, which you may have heard of in the past was also called the sustainable small farming and ranching course at one point. And um, this uh, is the first time that we're going to be launching this course this fall in a statewide collective cohort model in 13 different counties and two reservations. So um, if you're anywhere in Washington state or in Idaho or Oregon, check out the different site locations. You can sign up. Um, there are veteran scholarships available for those that were uh, are in the service at one point. And um, let's see, the course starts October 20th. So, um, they will also be just in the next, most likely 48 hours, you'll see information blasting out about that, about how you can register. And Great, yeah, thanks, thank you. Nicole. There's yeah. the, these are the, these are the locations um, in particular that are gonna be hosting courses. Awesome, thank you so much. So reach out if you have more questions about this and keep your, um, you know, keep keep a lookout for those upcoming announcements and share with your communities. And uh, Jude just had a, a question. So but it, these are virtual uh, offerings, but they're just going to be breakouts um, with the uh, specific locations so that it's more site specific to that appropriate cohort. So it is all virtual. We'll have a statewide lecture to start and then uh, uh, breakout rooms with um, counties that have agreed to um, provide localized resources. Yeah, so this is an awesome opportunity to highlight our different resource specialists throughout the state. So those specialists will be providing a Zoom-based lecture for the first portion of the class. They run every Tuesday for nine weeks. And um, the entire statewide cohort will tune into that lecture. And then um, for the second portion of the course night, um, they go into regional breakout spaces like Abba described. So it's a fantastic opportunity for everyone to capitalize on these great um, resources we have, and then also be able to, to community build and, um, and really check out what's going on in their local areas and learn about other farms and resource providers particular to those zones. So yeah, thank you. Great, and then I wanted to just put a, um, I wanted to announce this award. So it became official yesterday and um, we serendipitously, serendipitously also had Lane set up to talk today about her work and uh, we were awarded a WSDA specialty crop block grant award to actually um, expand radicchio markets in the Pacific Northwest. So I just put up a little bit of the press release here that we put together. The grant is called uh, building capacity and support for Pacific Northwest radicchio production through market expansion and international exchange. It's a collaborative program between the WSU Food Systems Program and the Culinary Breeding Network um, with Lane as uh, really the primary investigator for this project. And we're just super excited for um, everything that is um, that we're going to be able to do in the next three years to support uh, Radicchio in the Pacific Northwest. And the first project outreach event will be the Sagra del, del, del Radicchio, which will be held virtually on October 24th. And I'll let Lane talk a little bit more about this or as much as she wants about it in her own presentation as we move forward. 
um, since she's lined up next. And if you have any questions about this, please reach out to us. You can see here, um, you can also follow um, the activities at Chicory Week and also at Culinary Breeding Network on Instagram, as well as um, the, our social media networks through the Food Systems Program. So I am so excited to have Lane with us today. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with her off and on for the last, I guess, five or six years now. And um, it just continues uh, to really, um, it, it's just so amazing to see the innovative work that she's doing to really bring people together across the food system in so many different realms um, to see how innovative she was throughout uh, the pivot um, at the beginning of COVID producing incredible uh, um, IGTV segments with producers and folks across the food system, uh, not just in the Pacific Northwest, but around the world. Uh, Lane is an agricultural research, uh, researcher and faculty member at Oregon State University. Um, she works with dozens of, uh, not hundreds really, of uh, vegetable farmers across the Pacific Northwest. And in 2012, she created the Culinary Breeding Network which is a collaboration between plant breeders, seed growers, fresh market vegetable farmers, um, produce buyers, chefs, and chefs to work to improve the quality, improve quality in vegetables. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Lane. Again, we're thrilled to have her here today and uh, just to continue um, uh, th this great partnership that we've uh, been able to uh, um, really build on over the last few years. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, Thanks, Laura and Abba and Nicole for everything. I'm very excited about this new project and working more with you. Can you guys see this? Okay, hold on. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, very excited to be here today. Um, okay, so Laura told me, I uh, told you guys a little bit about um, myself, but I will tell you more and, 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 to, and talked about the Culinary Breeding Network and activities that have happened in the past and new ones that um, I'm really excited to do with WSU Food Systems. Um, okay, so I am, as, uh, as Laura told you, um, I'm a professor of practice now at Oregon State University um, and I founded the, the Culinary Breeding Network. And so, um, let's see if I can get to the next one. Hold on, I'm sorry. My slides not working there. Okay. Okay. So um, the mission of the, the Culinary Brain Network is to build community. Really, it is to bring together um, plant breeders, seed growers, farmers, produce buyers, chefs, basically all the stakeholders, which is really everyone in the public because we all eat food, right? Um, and, and I think that maybe Laura grabbed this uh, what the, the, the bio from the past because I have added grains in there because I've been working a lot more with grains also. Um, I would add fruits if I worked with fruits. Uh, well, botanically, I work with lots of fruits, right? Because anything with a seed is a fruit. But <laughs> um, I have been working more about grains and I'm going to talk to you about some of those um, projects and including uh, worked with ABBA and Laura for many years um, on the with the Cascadia Grains Conference. Um, but the, the way that the Culinary Breeding Network kind of came about is I've been, I've done research with Oregon State University for quite some time now, since 2005. And for quite some time, I was collecting data and I was doing the research part of, of research projects. Um, my background is in agronomy and entomology. And, um, but what I like to tell people all the time is I'm not the best scientist, but I'm pretty good at talking to people. <laughs> so um, in one of these projects, um, I was working with all these farmers and I was working with plant breeders that were creating new varieties of vegetables for organic farmers. And we were um, trying to find, we're basically testing those new varieties and those new lines and also varieties that already existed and growing those out on lots of different farms and seeing how they performed in the field. Um, and we got a lot of information that way. And, but then I said, well, you know, something that's very, very important to farmers, uh, especially organic farmers is, and especially fresh market vegetable farmers, which was the focus of this project was, was how do they taste? What's the flavor like, right? So I brought together um, a bunch of chefs to taste um, peppers was the, the crop we were working with at the time um, to let, uh, let us know like what what they thought about the flavor. And I won't get all into the story, but really 
I realized after that, that I didn't, I wasn't really asking the right questions. I was basically just telling them, give me a one to five and what the, you know, the flavor is of this particular pepper. And we had them taste, you know, nine different ones. So we knew how they performed in the field and we're thinking, well, you know, how they perform, you know, I wasn't even thinking how they perform in the kitchen, but I was thinking, what do they taste like? Do you guys like the flavor of them? And they filled out their forms, you know, gave a one to five for texture and flavor and all these things. But afterward, um, the, what the chefs told me was the things that they were really looking for in the peppers were rounded shoulders and straight walls and all these things that are traits that the, 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 um, the plant breeders are making those decisions. I usually have slides I add in about this, but I was trying to keep myself focused, but I, it's kind of important to tell you this background story. Um, so then that's when I realized I was like, wow, you know, the chefs have so many, you know, so much to say about this that probably the plant breeders are not thinking about because they're not so intimate in the kitchen with the things that they are working with. And so, you know, and it might sound like, well, not that important, but when you look, when you look at these peppers and you look at the rounded shoulders and the straight walls, we're actually talking about efficiency in a kitchen. You're talking about less food waste because of the way that you would actually cut them up and process them. So it was really meaningful comments that they're making, but it was unexpected to me. It wasn't, I was just asking them which ones taste the best and which ones had the best texture. And I realized that's not really the question. The question, the question should be, what do you want in vegetables? And so as probably everybody on this call knows, veg, you know, plant breeding is a long process. So it might take 10 years to develop a pepper that you're going to release. Um, so we need to be having those stakeholders together at the beginning of the process, right? So that was what I wanted to, you know, I, I, I started the Culinary Breeding Network in order to, um, you know, design meetings, um, events, just ways that we could have plant breeders and stakeholders being the chefs and the people that make hot sauce and the people that just shop at the farmer's market and everyone that eats just to, um, you know, have their opinions um, and they, them being able to have like a way to talk to the, to the, um, plant breeders about what it is they actually want. Because in these, a lot of these projects, we bring bringing the farmers and the plant breeders together, but we hadn't yet gone that next step to bring the consumers in and the people that are going to be using the final product. So that's really what the Culinary Breeding Network is, um, is uh, opportunities to, to bring all these folks together to improve quality in vegetables and grains. Okay, and so this is what I kind of think of also is it's like creating relationships, building community, and creating like really fun engagement. I always say that these things are like a trick. You'll see what we're talking about later. These events are really fun, but actually, we're uh, like the the what, what we're trying to do is educate people, right? But have a good time while doing that. Um, so the Culinary Brain Network is kind of the 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 arm of research projects and a lot of, and a lot of um, the projects that I work with that actually does the creation of like building that community, building relationships beyond just the farmers that would normally be involved in our projects, but going out to, uh, like I said, you know, you know, restaurateurs and chefs and people that are, you know, buying and selling produce and those that are, have hot sauce companies or any kind of value added company and bringing them into the projects with us so that they have a voice. Um, and then doing the outreach because that's a really big part of all the projects that I work on. So um, I work on a project with um, bar that focuses on barley, organic, hullless barley, um, development at Oregon State University. Right now we have an eat winter vegetables um, project that I'm going to tell you quite a bit about. I'm going to talk to you mostly about that project and the new radicchio project. Um, with the Eat Winter Vegetables involves radicchio, but there's nine different uh, vegetables that we work with on that project. That's an Oregon um, specialty crops block program grant. And we're in our last final year of that, which has a lot of events that we're now transitioning to virtual, which is fun and challenging. <laughs> um, Eat Winter Squash is another project. You can go to the eatwintersquash.com page and check that out and see what the, the that is already ended. Um, but you can see the work that we did around that. Um, Novik, which maybe some people have heard of, this is a project that's been going on for about 10 years now, the Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative. 
And then the Sagra di Radicchio, which we have renamed to Sagra del Radicchio to be more grammatically correct. <laughs> um, and this is the project that um, uh, Laura and I have uh, partnered on and we will have um, a really fantastic new project that comes out of that. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that as well. Okay, so, you know, the focus I'm gonna talk about today really is like, the work that Culinary Reading Network does to organize events, to make, um, like I said, to, to really design something that's very fun and educational to get people engaged. Um, and then developing marketing campaigns is, it's really interesting, you know, my background is in, um, you know, agronomy and entomology, but I find myself mostly as an event planner and marketing person. So, you know, I kind of have to make it up as I go, <laughs> but it's been really fun. Um, okay, oops, it went to the next one, but this is fine. So here's a picture of, um, this is John Navazio in the middle with the beret on, and he's a plant breeder that used to be uh, actually in Port Townsend with um, Organic Seed Alliance for a long time, but now he's with John, he's a plant breeder with Johnny's Seeds in Maine. Um, and here's a quote that um, I thought was pretty good from him about winter vegetables. I need to hide this a little bit. Okay, uh, winter vegetables are the fastest growing green segment. The market for these crops, especially radicchio, chicory, uh, spinach, and purple sprouted broccoli is expanding faster than any of us can keep up with. Um, I put this in here because it has been my focus for the past couple of years in um, grants that I have written um, and projects I've worked on um, to really focus on the winter vegetables um, to be able to support our farmers during that time to have more income and be able to keep people employed year round. Um, because they seem to be having, uh, you know, being successful during the main um, season, but having a harder time getting people excited about winter vegetables um, and, and selling them. So that's what the focus has been. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today is our, um, our Eat Winter Vegetables project. So like I said, this is a specialty crops block grant program um, project in Oregon through OSU. Um, the way that the, the, the grant is down here is we can't actually do any um, data collection or research. So it's purely marketing. We do grow out all these vegetables. These are the vegetables that are in the, the project up here. Um, and a lot of them we have um, built upon projects that we've already had funding for that have research behind them. So like the winter squash, like I said, we, I did a project with Alex Stone at Oregon State University um, that was all about winter squash because farmers have had a really hard time um, finding varieties that store really well that um, have a market. Um, so many times like when people are really excited about butternut and delicata, but they don't store very well. So we were finding um, varieties and different types that stored very well, um, but maybe were less known. So we were due to consumers. So we were developing a lot of um, recipes and videos and just a lot of uh, like kind of marketing around the ones that we're doing um, that we found that did the best. In here also we have um, collards now that we have we have added that is not on this list. There's a heirloom pro uh, collard project that's very cool that's led by the Seed Savers Exchange. Um, it's heirloomcollards.org if you want to check it out and it's a national um, variety trial of like 20 or 22 different varieties of um, collards that's and they have over 200 participants in that and that's pretty cool so we've added that to, to our we eat winter vegetables so we grow out many different varieties of all of these vegetables um, at our farm just south of portland and and uh, at osu uh, and we have field days that people can come and check them out mostly that's farmers that come and take a look at it we do have some chefs also that come out uh, so we look at them in the field and then we the ones that are ready to be harvested we actually do tastings um, about uh, around all of these veggies. Um, and then it's really big on the outreach too. So uh, the outreach, we have, like I said, the field days, but we have the Sagra events um, and we have the variety showcase. And um, I'm gonna tell you about both of those things here in just a couple of minutes. And they are actually coming up this winter as well virtually. And then we have a, a website, eatwintervegetables.com, which I do encourage that you um, take a look at um, when you can. 
And so this is the, um, the Sagra. What, one thing for like the marketing that we do is we um, go back here that you probably noticed, like this is a really beautiful um, poster. So we get posters um, printed um, and that look really beautiful. And then we distribute them to restaurants that we partner with so they can hang them in their restaurant. We give them to farmers markets, we give them to farmers um, so that people start, you know, getting more excited about it because they see something beautiful and it catches their eye and they're like, oh, what is this? Um, and then at the bottom, it has our website and they can go there and get a lot more information. So one big event that we do um, with this project is um, the Sagra. And Sagra is a, an Italian celebration. And they and traditionally in Italy, there's like 20 or 30,000 of these in Italy every year in different places. And so they are celebrations that celebrate something that is important in their specific area um, that has to do with food. So it might be an ingredient that they grow, like it might be chestnuts or it could be a type of you know, meat that they eat there or it could be a particular dish. Um, but that is like the inspiration for this. And so we do this in partnership with Friends of Family Farmers, which is a nonprofit down here uh, in Oregon um, and they have a fill your pantry event. So it's actually like a really big farmer's market where you can pre-order, but you can also buy things there. Uh, and the Sagra part of it is basically we're like the cheerleaders all around the perimeter of the farmer's market to get people very excited about the winter vegetables that are being sold there. So in the past, the failure pantry has been something where people mostly pre-ordered and they just went to a location and they picked it up and then they left. And so what we've done is we've made it more of like an all like a, an event to actually go to. So we have like a very beautiful space that we rent. And you know we had in this in this um, in this grant we had funding to rent the venue. Um, we have lots of you know really beautiful posters that are all around to get people excited about things. We have activities for them to do. Like there might be some. Um, activities for kids to do like make and then there's like a photo booth where you can have all these different squash and you can hug them and get your picture taken and um, there's a lot of fun events but they're also people are also buying a lot of produce there and so um, this last year we had over um, a thousand attendees which was incredible like in the past maybe there have been um, 300 people. So this last year there was a thousand people and there were 31 farmers that were selling um, at the market and they sold more than $87,000 of food, which was about 25,000 more than the last year and all, pre you know, previous, all, each year had been growing, but never so much. Um, so this was um, very exciting to have this be, um, you know, so so well received. Um, one thing I didn't mention, well, I think it's on the next slide, hold on. What, there's, so there's many things that happen at the Sagra and here we do a lot of um, cooking demonstrations. And so these are all, um, Catherine Doomling is over here on the left-hand side and she has cook with what you have. And the middle is, uh, and so she partners with a lot of farmers to write their CSA newsletters. And she has a website where it has lots of um, recipes and um, a lot of folks that have farmers that have CSAs will give um, a membership for all their members to Catherine's um, service. So you can go online with your password that you get with your CSA and get tons of different um, recipes. Like there's just thousands of recipes that she's got on there that she's developed um, and recommends for people. Um, and it's called Cook With What You Have. In the middle, we have Tim Wastel, who is a restaurant chef who oftentimes is showing us um, how to use vegetables, break them down. He's doing some squash butchery right here um, in your own kitchen. So we have this like place where, cause that we found that that is one thing that people are really afraid of is um, cutting up squash. So he shows like, this is the kind of knife to use. This is the way that you need to, to handle it um, safely. And so that people will no longer have the fear of cutting squash. <laughs> and then on the right hand side, we have jo um, Jim Dixon, who's another, um, other than Tim, who's a restaurant chef, all the other chef folks are typically people that are more of culinary uh, like advocates and getting people to cook in their home. So the focus is he's making something with celeriac and he's making a soup and he's like, look, here's the soup, taste it. So people get to taste things. Um, 
and they love it. And they're like, oh, this is really great. I never really paid attention to celeriac before. He gives them the recipe. We have them printed right there. They're also on our website. Um, and then people will say, oh, that's great. Where can I buy celeriac? And then we tell them which booth there is celeriac and then they go buy it. And it was very successful this time. We had it really this last year. Um, that hap this happened in December last year of 2019. It was really successful because we really knew like what all the farmers were going to bring um, and we could tell them where to go buy it. Um, and all of the folks, all the farmers told us that they sold out of all these things that we actually promoted. So there was promotion of all of those nine different vegetables happening all around the perimeter of the um of the actual sale of the of the you know the fill your pantry sale um we and i because i am always trying to promote um uh, radicchio we had this separate room which, which we call an exploratorium where people could even dive deeper and learn more about uh in this case it was radicchio and garlic so we had a garlic breeder with a lot of different types of garlic talking about the differences in them and then we also had um, our radicchio folks that, and this is Cassie who you saw a picture of her in the first um, slide that Laura had up, Cassie here on the left in the red. She has been organizing the Sagra del Radicchio with us um, and has been like the main organizer the past two years that we've had that. And then this is Jason and Siri who are farmers in Duval, Washington, which is just about 35 minutes probably outside of Seattle. They grow a lot of radicchio. I'm gonna talk more about them in a few minutes, but this is like this really cool room where you could get a lot more in depth and understand a lot more about garlic and radicchio and ways to cook with them too. Um, and we found that having kind of these areas of like really like geeking out with the folks that grow it and that know a lot about it and sharing that information make, does really make consumers a lot more interested in and in actually eating it because you know radicchio is quite it can be quite bitter and if people don't appreciate that flavor um, to have a room like this and really talk to individuals, there were chefs in this room too that could tell them, well, this is the way that you could probably make it that would you would maybe like it better. These are the things to pair it with. Um, then people um, really start to embrace it a lot more. And after these events, I have surveyed people that have attended and asked them which of the vegetables they are more excited about now. And every time I do that survey, it comes up, the, it is actually the crops that we have gone the most in depth with. So radicchio and winter squash have been two that we have really had a strong focus on. And those always rise to the top because they've been given the most amount of information about those two crops. So we have our eatwintervegetables.com, also part of the project. This is what we developed um, to be able to talk about the project, but also here's uh, some of the other chefs and culinary advocates that have participated in the event. And so you can go to uh, the website if you didn't you know, grab the, the recipe and you can find all the recipes um, online on eatwintervegetables.com. There's also some videos about how to prepare them. Uh, on the website. And this is the same for eat, eat winter squash as well. We have things that's very specific to squash. We're trying to blend these two um, websites together, but that hasn't happened yet. Okay, so now we'll talk about radicchio. I don't know if anybody has any questions. I haven't seen any yet, and maybe we'll do that at the end. So um, I'm almost done here. I'm going to talk about radicchio, and then I'm happy to take any questions. I'm just holding up the flavor wheel that you developed from um, the Eat Winter Squash program. Yep. And I didn't know if you wanted to just give a quick shout out about some of the consumer research you do to oh. develop this kind of stuff too. Yeah, sorry, I didn't put, I, I had so many slides that I was like, should I show this or not? So they, they, we did do this really fun thing in the We Eat Winter Squash project where, like I said, like the, the squash that we were finding that would be the most successful for, um, farmers to grow or squash that were less known, right? So we had to get people really excited about them. And we also want to get people really 
um, to recognize the differences in winter squash. They're not all the same. You don't use them all the same way. And they're actually available and taste the best at very different times of the year. I mean, one of the biggest problems is like winter squash is in your, our grocery stores like year round, but especially you start seeing it a lot in like August. And it's like, this is not time for winter. We like to say, let's put the winter back in winter squash. So one way that we were thinking would be a really great way to get people um, to be excited about different types is to actually talk about the lexicon, right? The lexic, like develop a lexicon, which is develop the language for like they have in wine. And so that's what this wheel that Laura's holding up is all about, right? It's like, if we can describe the difference, then people will start thinking them, of them as different things. So, um, we got together a bunch of chefs and um, actually the people that were the best with this. And, and so it was, it was um, winemakers and coffee roasters were very good because they're very used to describing what they're sensing by when they're taste with words. And so we had, I think 30 uh, folks like that that were all together and we tasted all, they're all Maxima species winter squash. Um, raw and then roasted and pureed and developed that wheel. And so, and we, and people have really loved it. Um, it's been fantastic. And it really does help to, at, at first I was like, oh, is, are we just getting really overboard or we're just, we're getting very bourgeois with this situation. <laughs> but like the farmers have said, this has been fantastic to be able to, and so if you don't know how flavor wheels work and the inside is more words that are like musky or fruity. And then as it goes out, the, the more further out, then you describe like, well, fruity, what exactly is it citrusy? Is it like nectarine? And you actually start realizing that you can, you know, the more you practice it, you can pick up these flavors in winter squash. And I have seen that in using that in describing different types of um, squash to compare them from one another, it really does get people more interested in it. I can tell you that I have tasted a squash and, and immediately thought, I don't like that. This is, this is no good. I don't like it. And then having a, a farmer say to me, we were using the wheel for an activity and she said, wow, it tastes like watermelon rind. And then I just having that, like, I guess it's the power of suggestion, having her describe the flavor like that actually made me like the squash more. And I said, oh, wow, I'm going to give that another chance. So um, it has been really interesting to use that. Um, and, but we have a chef that works with us to develop the flavor descriptions for different types, like different, a lot of times varieties of the same vegetable. And, um, he, and he's worked a lot and used that wheel um, to, to help with that. So it's really great. I, thanks for bringing that up. Um, and, you know, people have done this more with grains, I feel like that's something that you can find with like wheat and with barley, um, but they fleshed out a lot more of those flavors, but we haven't seen it that much with fruits. I, and the, the idea actually did come up from a, from a farmer here who is um, in Forest Grove and she really wanted this for tomatoes. Um, she's like, I have all these tomatoes and, ha and like people always ask that, right? They're like, which tomatoes should I get? And when a farmer is selling like 25 different tomatoes. <laughs> um, so she had asked for that. And I said, well, we have funding to work on winter squash. So we're going to make a winter squash one, but it's been, it's been really useful. Okay. So back to radicchio. So I don't know how much people are, you know, used to seeing this many different types of radicchio. Um, this is the one over here on the, the, the far left, the round one that most people think of as radicchio, right? This is called Kyoja. And, um, the, and, that's the one you most of the time see in the farmer's markets. Um, can you guys see this arrow? I'm moving around. Okay. So this guy right over here is called Treviso Precoce. That mean, Precoce means early. This is Treviso Precoce. This one's Treviso Tardivo. Tardivo means late. So these, these names that I'm saying to you actually are places. And I didn't put this slide in here, but um, there's a map that we have that you can see it points out here's all these places they're all in the Veneto in um, in Italy um, and they are their name for those places so this is called like Rosa di um, Chioggia which means the red of Chioggia this one is Rosa di um, Treviso Percoce which is like the red or the red of um, uh, Treviso early <laughs> and this one's late and this one's called Luzia 
which is another place. Um, this one is called Verona. Um, this one is called Castle Franco. Um, this is Puntarelle. And these two, they just call Rosa. These are these two pinkies here are one of the reasons I think that Radicchio is having um, its heyday. <laughs> um, it's really beautiful. And it's, if anyone uses social media or follows like food, um, you know, media, you will see that this is in the last like five years, maybe, maybe three years, it's really blown up. And a lot of times they do annoying things like they call it pink lettuce, which it is not, <laughs> but it, because it is so strikingly beautiful, it gets a lot of attention. So it's really helped our cause in trying to get people very excited about radicchio. And I'll tell you that the reason that we are very excited in that, you know, Laura and I wrote this grant to, to do work with radicchio is it's a really promising crop for farmers in the Pacific Northwest. Um, our climate is very similar to the Veneto, which is where these um, vegetables are from and grown um, very successfully. It's a little bit tricky to grow them. Uh, farmer, that farmers that have grown them, like Jason Siri, who you've seen a photo of previously, um, they they went to Italy. You know, they went to Italy. They farmed in Italy. Um, they have been doing it for a really long time and figured it out, and they do it quite successfully. But there's a lot of farmers that um, are wanting to grow radicchio, and um, they keep trying and trying. But you know, like there's a lot that they have to sort out. There's a lot of information. Like I went to Italy in 2014 to visit a seed company, and and when I got there, I realized, oh well, this is why. <laughs> well, this is why we don't know how to grow it because they have. Um, we didn't have the best seed back then. And now we have developed some relationships with Italian seed companies that are um, that we have access to the seed uh, through a company in Washington. Um, so we have better genetics to work with, but there's a lot of information about like the cultural management of radicchio and timing of planting and all of this that we, we need more information. Um, so that's what this, this um, one of the things that this new project will focus on is getting that information from the Italians uh, and presenting that and sharing that with farmers here and then also marketing this crop because this is a crop that can be sold fresh out of the field. It is a crop that can be stored for quite some time if stored properly and it is something that can overwinter and you know and harvested all throughout the winter time and then there's a lot of them that are very late and they stay in the field very successfully if planted at the right time um, and then they head up in January, I mean, um, uh, like January, February, and March. So it's a, it's something that's really wonderful to grow here uh, for farmers and to sell all winter long, and it can be quite profitable. Um, so, so some of the outreach events that we've already done, like even before this, uh, this project, we said, well, we just love radicchio and we're just going to do a sagra about radicchio anyway. So this has happened uh, for the past two years in 2018 and 19 in November, we've done this event um, in, um, in uh, Seattle. And so again, really groovy, fun, like, uh, you know, graphics to go along with the event that people really like. Um, these are all the folks down here in the bottom right hand side that have organized the event and there's a couple of restaurant owners here we've got um, Jackie that owns the Tom Douglas restaurant groups we have Yasu who owns um, London Plain they're both uh, like Jackie's got 15 restaurants in Seattle and Yasu has two Cassie has been organizing the Sagra we've got Jason Siri that own local roots farm they've been growing radicchio for about 15 years now um, Brian um, Campbell, who um, is the owner of Uprising Seeds and um, does a lot of his own um, growing of, seed, of radicchio seed here and importing some uh, pretty soon from Italy and myself. And so it's been a very fun event. This in the middle here is a raw bar, as we call it. So all those different types you just saw in the last slide, we have them out here. We have their names with them and they're shredded and people can just taste them raw and they can look at them. And this is kind of like a, um, it goes all the way around all these tables. And in the inside, we've got our experts. So this is, you know, Linda, who uh, works for Osborne Seed. And we've got Siri, who know a lot about um, radicchio and can answer radicchio growing questions as well as some culinary questions for folks. 
um, oh, this is my son and he's back here too. Here's my son and his friend. So there's like a little, you know, we like to do a photo booth. So they're standing there holding their favorite heads of radicchio. Um, there's lots of tasting. So we have these tables all the way around the whole entire room that um, that were that focus on a different type of radicchio. Each one focuses on a different type of radicchio and you get to taste it. Um, and then this is some really cool, like, um, you know, we just like to show anything weird too. Like, so they do a lot of forcing, um, which is, um, you know, taking plants out of the field and then putting them into a chamber that usually they put them into water and they have them grow and they don't get any light. And so they blanch, uh, they get sweeter um, and they change forms quite a bit. So they do a lot of that in Italy. So talking about that process as well. Okay, so that's the Sagra del Radicchio. And then the, the Variety Showcase is a very big event that um, I typically do about once a year. I've done it eight times now, I believe. Um, and this is really to focus on um, plant breeding and talk about the importance of organic plant breeding um, and give people the opportunity. Like I said, uh, the Culinary Breeding Network is all about creating like creating opportunities for people to be able to interact with plant breeders to talk about what it is that they want out of a, a, you know, a variety. So whether that's a farmer or that's a, you know, someone who's got the hot sauce company or like just a consumer being able to talk right there to the plant breeder. Um, so it's a series of tables. This is one table. We had 40 tables that featured vegetables uh, and grains last year. We had 130 different participants so folks at the tables, and then we had about 700 attendees. So at the table could be, um, is gonna be the breeder typically, and then a chef that they're paired with. This is this, and this is a radicchio and squash table. Um, and this is Mirta, who I'm gonna talk about later. She's a farmer in, um, she's a farmer in Italy who used to live here in uh, Oregon for a little while. So um, I'm focusing on radicchio. So I'm showing the radicchio table. The radicchio table was huge. Like usually I like to have two people, the breeder and the chef and make it really simple. But then sometimes it gets out of hand. So here we've got lots of chefs. This is Kathy Wims who has Nostrana who's quite famous for a, a, a radicchio salad. We've got growers. Uh, from Washington and Oregon that'll be part of our new project and we've got seed company reps uh, and chefs all together that are trying to get people really excited about um, radicchio here. Um, here's another uh, table. This is this is uprising seeds table. Actually, this is a beet that is originally from um, France and this is so this is one of their forced radicchio. So this is what um, this particular radicchio that's called Isontina would look like if you grew it in the field and then took it out and put it in that forcing chamber like I was talking about. Um, so this is this is something that a lot of farmers are interested in learning how to do, um, don't know how to do and they know how to do that in Italy. <laughs> Um, okay, so also this is a this was a um, an exhibit that we did at the Variety Showcase, and it is an exhibit of the trip that we went on in January to visit Radicchio farmers. So um, my friend Mirta that I just showed you that picture of, she decided that she wanted to have a an event in Italy very similar to the Sagra and the Variety Showcase. And she invited me to help her um, organize that and then said, well, if you're going to come here, why don't we go ahead and visit some radicchio farms and then you can get some of your radicchio questions answered. And I invited a couple of people, which turned into 22 people. So 22 Americans that were mostly um, farmers and chefs. Um, went to Italy and we visited, these are the areas that we went. So the, we flew into Bologna and then we went into the Veneto uh, and we went to the Fruili and we also went into Trentino um, Alto Adige, which is where Mirta is from. And we visited a lot of different farmers uh, and seed growers to understand a little bit more about um, radicchio, growing radicchio. And like most things, the more you find, you learn, the more you realize that you don't know very much. <laughs> and there's a lot more to learn. Um, so this was very valuable for the farmers that were, that went on this. Um, and this would be hopefully part of our new project will be going back and documenting a lot of what we saw and bringing it back to share with farmers here um, so they understand a little more about how the techniques of uh, growing radicchio successfully. 
And here we are, um, the Radico Expedition. This is just out in the field. This is a, a farmer that does his own selections of radicchio. These are just all the folks that went on that. Um, and this is Mirta. Uh, some of the folks that we met, I actually have known these two individuals. This is um, Samuele, who owns Levantia seed in Italy and has a lot of really fantastic um, varieties of radicchio that you can now get through Osborne seed. So any of the anybody who's a farmer that might be on and wants to grow um, radicchio, there's, he's got fantastic seed that you can buy now through um, a company in Washington. And this is a breeder named Andrea, and he has a company called Smarties, and his varieties are going to be available this next year through Uprising Seeds, um, which is really exciting. So this is just some really absolutely beautiful radicchio that they're growing there. That This is the goal. <laughs> Um, just uh, some more of the farmers that we visited there and showing us the techniques. This is that forcing technique, which they, they grow, they grow in the field for quite some time. And then they grow them in these chambers, um, that are filled with water and they get to become like a big slimy mess and they look terrible, but then they pull them out and they look like roses. And this was the, the event that we had at the end. I know I'm going on long here, so cut me off if you want to, um, uh, I'm, I'm toward the end. This was the the jazz, which is the the event that Mirta had up in um, her region, Alta Adige, at the end. That was inspired by uh, the Sagra and the variety showcase that she's attended here in the U.S. And it was really fantastic. A lot of young. Um, Italian farmers, which is really cool because you don't see young Italian farmers a lot of times. So a lot of people with a lot of energy that are getting people to buy locally. Um, I think that we all have like a very um, romantic idea of how people cook and buy uh, food in Italy. And it usually is not actually like that. <laughs> so they have the same you know, issues that we have here with the uh, big food systems. Um, and, you know, corporate ag. And so this is a group of people like ourselves that are trying to get back to a local food system. And it was really inspiring. So some of the tables really, you know, at all these events, it's really trying to like, just tell your story and, and, and tell your story in an engaging and beautiful way. The Italians do this really well, always. Um, and so they're showing us a lot of the things that they uh, grow and are quite proud of, and a lot of traditional things that are in, at risk of, of, you know, going away. So just some of the, these are some of the, you know, radicchio and some of the brassicas that they grow in that region that are really cool. Again, a lot of these things will be available through seed next year because after we made the connections with the seed growers, um, they'll be selling them through the U.S. now. And, you know, we're, like I said, we're seeing a lot in the media about radicchio. People are really excited about it, especially because of the pink, um, seeing that. There's this, this is a really good article. This is Christy who came with us. She's a journalist out of New York City. She came with us on the Radicchio expedition and then she wrote a, um, an article and heated about it. Um, all of the press that's come from all of these things is uh, on the Culinary Brain Network website under press. You can check that out if you like. Um, it's a good article. Um, that This was just a quote from Jason, basically talking about how, um, that he really thinks that Radicchio uh, represents a localized food system. Um, and that, you know, that it, you know, you see, he's talking about how he's, well, we can read it. We, I'll just give everybody a minute to read it <laughs> themselves. So I think when sometimes, especially in like food media, when can, you can get a lot of times, um, criticism about something just being kind of bougie or like not so, you know, just for the elite. And it's like, especially when you start talking about a more obscure uh, vegetable and maybe something that looks really pretty, um, that it's not really important. But for the farmers that went on this trip and the farmers that I have talked to about this grant that Laura and I just got, they're like, radicchio is really important to our business. And we see it as something that is um, can you know support our farm all year round and bring us money in um, during the winter time and keep people employed during the winter. And we stand behind it and think that it is important for our food system. So the upcoming things almost done. We got the rad. TV coming up. So we took Radicchio del, I uh, mean, I'm sorry, Saga del Radicchio that you saw, which is normally in person. And we have transformed it to Rad TV, 
which is going to be a one day event. It's going to be on October 24th. If you go to www, I mean, all the W's, uh, eatradicchio.com, you can register there. It's free. Um, but we are going to um, have presentations on history, culture, cooking. Cribs is, uh, that was like an MTV show, remember, when you went to visit the the homes of famous musicians. Well, this is going going on field tours with farmers. There's gonna be folks from Italy that are involved in this, folks from Washington, uh, as we're creating our cultural exchange here. I think it's gonna be really fantastic. Um, ABBA is like the key to this <laughs> because she is teaching us all about the technology of how to make this thing happen. So that's gonna happen. And then the variety showcase and winter vegetable soccer are kind of going to be like a blended uh, online affair this year. And it's going to be um, talks and field tours and cooking demos and all of this um, exploring plant histories and origins and domestication, medicinal, nutritional, culinary um, elements, farm visits, all these different things. We have a different week um, for all of the different veggies that we're working with. We also added a week here of indigenous winter foods um, that we're excited about. And um, I hope again, that I hope that this goes off well. I think so. There's a lot of excitement about all the people that are organizing it. Um, so I think it's gonna be pretty great. So you can also find out about this on culinarybreedingnetwork.com and register there again, free. Um, and then this is the last slide. So <laughs> this is how you can get in touch with me um, and also some websites. I mentioned them, Culinary Breeding Network, Eat Winter Vegetables, Eat Winter Squash, um, and then the Instagrams to follow. Uh, also, WSU Food Systems has an Instagram too, um, and we'll try to keep you abreast of all the good Radicchio news. And I'm so excited to work on this project with Laura and her, her, her team. Lane, thank you so much. I am just, I like I said, I'm always inspired by your work and it always makes me hungry after, I'm, after I watch a presentation of yours as well. Um, we have some questions here uh, in the chat box. Linda McLean. Um, wanted to know if uh, you're looking for more growers or grow sites, and if so, what are the requirements? Um, and I know this is something that we're talking about with the grant project is um, helping form uh, Pacific Northwest Radicchio Growers Association. So people who are interested in Radicchio mm -hmm. would be able to learn more about it, uh, more about growing it in their specific region um, and what the requirements would be. Um, and then she also asked, what are some good questions that I should ask when surveying growers on their crops, taste, textures, amounts produced. So she just has some general questions. And I, Linda, I know you're on the call. So if you wanna ask directly or be more specific, you can as well. Yeah, mostly what I was, I was kind of referring more the questions because I did that, you know, salad bowl, milpa seed blanket mix. So I was asking people what, what they grew and just to try to get an idea of how I should survey them on what they grew as kind of an experiment. We did a salad bowl milpa seed blanket with a variety of greens in it. And one of them was the purple sprouting broccoli, but um, orac, amaranth, mustard, you know, just a bunch of different greens. And so I'm curious to know what I should be asking them to find out how their prog products grew. So you are having fun. If there is anything. You're having farmers grow those things? No, individual. Well, I guess there were individual people. So it was more of a home garden. They could do a container or a four by eight garden bed. Uh-huh. And you had them grow. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding the question really well. Um, Correct. Having, you are having other people grow these things for themselves to eat? Yeah, it was yes. a project and, and that came out of actually a hub call when we had um, Valerie Segrist and Nora Frank present on some of the tribal uh, food systems work that was going on. And they mentioned this project in the southeastern United States where they came up with a milpa seed blanket mm -hmm. um, that was being distributed to southwestern tribes. And so OSA and WSU, uh, Linda in particular from the Colville tribe, work to develop a local milpa seed blanket. And so I think you're interested, Linda, in just kind of trying to find out how what people thought of it, right? From like a use perspective or... Right, because yeah. I'll be sending out a post-survey. They had to do a pre-survey and 
I've, you know, we've been able to harvest some salads from it. And I just want to know how people thought of it because they're different types of plants that we normally don't eat. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't normally eat mustard or amaranth or calendula. Yeah. But that was in this mix. So I wanted to know what they thought of the flavors. The salad, I've actually liked them. They're, they have good flavor. Yeah, I mean, I guess I just normally do like a, like a survey monkey thing and I ask them and I just say like, what did you think about, you know, I mean, I guess I um, would ask them if they would grow it again. Um, I would ask them what they thought about each individual thing, you know, um, and but yeah, I guess what you're asking is like flavor texture. I mean, it depends on what you're trying to get out of it, I guess. It's like, um, you know, when I do these tastings, it's like, do I want to know, you know, it, it doesn't really work. I guess when I've done the tastings before, I'm like, give me a one to five. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? I usually don't see very many differences at all. It's mostly like, what is it that I want to get at the end of it? It's like, would you grow this again? Did you like this? Did it work for this thing that you're doing? And more asking questions like that. And then if you did want to get information about like, like sometimes I ask about, can you give flavor descriptions? Can you give a word that describes what this flavor is? But I think in this, you're just wanting to know like if they want to grow it again and if it worked for the, 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 mm -hmm. the bowl. And maybe even how they used it. You know, did they eat it fresh? Did they, you know, did they have, did they cook it in some way? Some of the plants that were in the mix be interesting. Okay, thanks. I also wonder, Linda, um, if you, if it would be helpful too to like have pictures that identify the different varieties that were in that seed packet mix, just in case, like, just so oh, folks- there are, we did include, we included that at the very beginning so that people would know what was coming up because awesome. there were nine different plants coming up and I wanted them to be able to identify what they were growing and eating. Totally. Yeah. So it sounds like you've already done that and it'd be cool to integrate it into the, the, um, the feedback as well. That's awesome. And I know for radicchio in particular, there are growers in Washington in both Eastern and Western Washington. So we feel like it's a really promising crop for uh, vegetable producers really across the state. Um, so I think that's something too that, you know, with the grant, you know, we wrote it before COVID, but we were really hoping to expand some of the radicchio work that was happening in Seattle into other parts of Washington as well. So um, particularly Eastern Washington between Walla Walla and Spokane, and then up in uh, Northern um, Washington, up in the Skagit Whatcom area. Yes, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Oh no, don't worry. The, yeah, there's like a, in the grant also, what was doing these smaller festas in different areas. Like um, we do have a farmer that is that went with us in Italy uh, to Italy, um, the hay shaker farm in Walla Walla, and they grow a lot of radicchio. And again, it does, you know, even if, I mean, it's pretty cold hardy. And then even when it, you know, gets seriously cold, you can, um, you can store it for quite some time. And the, and so also in there, one of the, one of the objectives is to create this association possible co-op because for instance Jason series has a lot of demand for radicchio and they flood every year they're in the floodplain and they flood at the beginning of November typically and so everything has to be harvested before the flood and then stored and so they can keep it in storage for let's say you know five or six weeks and but then when they're sold out they're sold out but people still want to buy from them so uh, the idea was to create an association and potentially like i said a cooperatives for all of the radicchio growers to work together to create you know to sell under one label so that um you were constantly getting local radicchio do we have other other questions for lane Thank you so much, Lane. And um, just as, as a reminder, this was recorded and it's also live on YouTube right now. So um, you can go back and reference uh, this presentation anytime you want. You can find it on our WSU YouTube channel. Um, and I am just gonna go ahead and share. I'm gonna have you stop sharing, Lane. Yeah. And I'll share. I did cover my bird, but it does still seem to want to participate in this meeting. So sorry about that. 
Um, and my sharing is disabled now as well. So I'm not gonna worry about sharing that last slide. It was just our, our slide to share. Any other upcoming um, events, information, anything else that people want to uh, provide a shout out for um, on our club call this morning? Actually, I kind of have a question um, on Radicchio, but also just generalizing it to, oh, sorry, this is Chris Iberly from WSTA, Regional Market uh, Farm to School Lead. Uh, sort of a farm to school related question because um, for a couple of reasons. My main question is, I really like this concept of, you know, Radicchio kind of by default being, it has to kind of be a local product. Um, you know, and I think there's other examples. Uh, you shared like some of the winter vegetable work. I'm wondering how we can use this model or thinking about using this model to apply it to other crops. Um, you know, I think of like kohlrabi or pluot or things that, and this is relates to farm to school because when we're coaching people or, you know, helping people figure out how to prioritize like a Washington room product, it's like, if you want to order kohlrabi and serve it to your kids, you kind of by default have to go directly to a farm or work directly with a farm. It's not a very common thing for a distributor or a broad, you know, broad line um, supplier to have. Um, so I think there's, you know, there's, there's like a leverage point in that. <clears throat> Um, and I think that's what, you know, seeing and highlighting and doing so much work around developing the varietals of radicchio and like building up a culture around that has been really cool to see and watch over the years. So I don't know, kind of, I don't know if there's really a question there, but I guess, yeah, curious how that applies, you know, how you might see that applying to other crops and, and vegetables and as a way to, yeah, continue that relocalization that um, Jason and others observed, you know, around a specific crop like this. I mean, I don't know if this answers the question. But it's like, yeah, I've, I mean, all the time, right? So I'm like, right, thinking about the next grant I have to write. And, and, and I have been talking a lot, especially during COVID with, um, with farmers that have had to go back to a CSA model where maybe they, you know, most of the farmers I work with have like multiple outlets, right? Multiple markets. So they might have CSA, they might do farmer's markets, they might sell to restaurants. A lot of the, re like a lot of the farmers I work with around Portland had moved away from CSA and had um, um, like done mostly restaurant sales. And so then when COVID hit, like everybody went back to CSA and, you know, they sold out of their CSAs and that's great. But it also is like CSA comes with its own, you know, set of issues where you get a lot of complaints <laughs> from consumers and, and cause you know, they don't get choices. It's like, this is, you know, that's the spirit of the, you know, the CSA model is you are like taking, taking, you know, you're, 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 you know, partnering with the, the farm and you roll with the punches, right? It's like, if they have a crop failure, you don't get this thing, or this is what they grow and this is what you're going to get. And so a lot of things that grow really well here, like kohlrabi, I'm thinking about this because you said kohlrabi, kohlrabi, beets, um, radicchio, um, the, what I'm trying to think there was a couple other oh, eggplant, um, have come with a lot of complaining from CSA customers. So I had, I had talked to a lot of the farmers during the season and said, okay, what, what is it that you have in your farm model that you're not going to drop that you want people, you basically want people to in, appreciate more. And so a lot of these games, things have come up and um, I feel like those need the focus, you know, I mean, I guess from my point of view, I'm like, my, well, my job, I feel like is to like, get people excited about those things. So writing another a new grant to kind of focus on those local things that, that we would get people more excited about because right now, and, and you know, and it seems like recipes don't seem to be enough. Like it has been, and like people are like, well, why don't you make some, develop some recipes and have some videos? I'm like, I don't think there's any shortage of that on the internet last time I looked, <laughs> you know? So so it's kind of like, you know, it's try, it's kind of like g giving them recipes and giving them culinary history and giving them interesting, this is what we're trying to do in the saga this year is like, we're like, okay, well, let's just geek out on the things, right? Let's get people like, like a lot more knowledgeable about them and tell them about folklore and look at pictures of art and all these things that, that will get like much more excited about, you know, kohlrabi than saying, here's your kohlrabi. This is one recipe, do it like this. So that there's a little more meat to it. So they get excited about it. Yeah. Um, 
don't know if that answers your question. Like, but then, I mean, like the, like the next step of getting these into schools is like a whole another ball of wax, you know? Um, but um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of underappreciated vegetables that grow really well here that we want people to be excited about and be, yeah, and that aren't in like the conventional grocery stores, like you're not going to go to Safeway and see Kohlrabi ever, probably. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, I think it's a great point, like just, and this, the Radicchio work that's gone into it is really about fast tracking, changing cultural taste, and like, you know, speeding up that process of getting people back to various, I mean, it's, and it helps with that because there's, as you mentioned with CSA farmers or others, like that constant tension between, you know, um, growers that sell direct to consumers, which is who I work with and support a lot through our program. Um, the, you know, there's a spectrum of, they just want to grow everything possible and expect, you know, consumers to, to catch up and like be willing and wanting to eat everything that goes into their CSA boxes and, you know, where consumers are at with what they're exposed to and what they're familiar with and what the tastes are. And, and so, yeah, I think work like this around, like you said, going into the history, it's not just recipes, it's um, developing people's tastes to be adapted to the seasons. And that's, that's constant consumer education that we'll have to continue to do. Um, and yeah, working in schools and anybody that's done, there's are some schools that have done frizzy and, and radicchio taste tests um, through SnapEd and others, I think in Washington. But um, I think radicchio in particular is uh, like we established it's a unique taste. So um, as you all know that have kids, they have very particular palates. So um, not all of them are gonna get on board right away with that. And, but I think there's other, other new things that they are, you know, even adults and educators are often surprised or school nutrition staff are surprised how quickly um, kids can change their mind uh, around certain items and really get excited about, you know, really sometimes obscure uh, and, and really exciting, you know, new, new foods. Yeah, you know, I think, I mean, I showed that picture of my son, my son and his friend that went to the Sagrado Radicchio. And I mean, they're picky and they're kids and they don't want to eat a bunch of bitter stuff, but they like, after they went to a big celebration about all of it, like they, they like it, you know? I mean, I've seen this with kids that, I mean, whatever, I live in Portland, right? So I'm in like this bubble, but, <laughs> but, you know, I know kids that have gone to the fermentation fest here and like love fermented foods now, you know? Right. Get involved. They like, oh, I'm going to make this at home. Like one of my son's friends is like, oh yeah, I'm doing this at home. I'm doing that. And I gave him like the wild fermentation book and he was really, you know, is really into it. So I think that you, I mean, you disguise it and you trick them and you make it into like a fun event and then they're going to taste it. They're going to taste like radicchio at the Sagrado Radicchio when it was live, you know, like 15 different ways, you're probably going to like a couple of those ways, you know, and then you're more educated on like, how you like it. You're like, well, I like it when it's like paired with like something really fatty or like a, it has like a, whatever, a dressing that has anchovy on it or something, you know? And then you become, and then you start, you're just becoming more educated about it and how it, and the best way that it, it tastes for your particular taste. But like shoving all that information down their throats, I think works <laughs> and it gets them excited about it. I think one of the things too, Lane, that you shared about the ex uh, the expedition that was so interesting was how, and kind of an opportunity for Pacific Northwest growers was how sort of married Italians are to like what you can, like they're the, a limited view of what you can use each variety of radicchio for. It was like each one's grown for like one dish or one way of, or, you know, maybe multiple, but it's, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of flexibility and how you're going to prepare it or even regionally what you'll eat like if you live in this region you eat this one and you wouldn't eat and so i i really appreciated the way you talked about this incredible opportunity for pacific northwest growers to really be able to utilize a lot of that agrobiodiversity but in ways that are less restrictive yeah exactly you know like it's like punterelle like punterelle is used one way period you know it's eaten in this one you know it's eaten in rome you do this one thing with it and that's it and then we as a mayor, and it's like, I like to tell that story and, and like 
say like, this is the traditional way and it's a really great way to eat it, but then like, we're going to do whatever we want to with it. And it's really cool for the Italians to see that because they're just like, mm, no, we don't like that. We don't like you're doing that. But then when we went to, got together at the jazz, they're like, they really, really appreciated how we were like, they, they felt like we were really doing justice and giving a lot of respect to the way that they grow radicchio and the dishes that they use and also be in, and also being innovative and creating new things like they were really receptive to it um and they typically as you know like they're typically not so it was i think it was really cool for them as well and it got them growing a little bit you know do we have any other questions for lane I see an announcement here also that Henry uh, put up and it's for the um, the King County um, fund. So there's the, it's closing on October 7th. It's the uh, small farm e-commerce program, King County. And it's for King County farmers. So if you have King County farmers in your network, please make sure that they know about this. Applications are due on October 7th by 5 p.m. And you can find more information about this on the Business Impact Northwest uh, website as well. And um, Henry did post that in the link. Is there anything else that you want to share about that, Henry? Uh, no, uh, nothing to share. That was great. And then, but uh, if, I'll put my email also. So if anyone has any questions or if, they, if you have any contacts you want to just forward to me, I'm happy to give additional info or support with that. Great, thank you. Any other announcements or topics that anyone wants to share? Well, I just wanna put another plug out for the October 24th Rad TV. And I know, um, Abbott, you just put the link to that. You put links to that into the chat box. And again, just really extend my gratitude and thanks for Lane participating in the hub today and just for all of the incredible collaborative work that we've done throughout the years. Um, just like she said, uh, working on Cascadia grains, some of the early work that I was introduced to through Organic Seed Alliance with her. Um, and then as we continue to sort of build uh, this intersection between our programs with the Culinary Breeding Network and our food systems innovation events, uh, we really see um, that it's it there we have we have so many different species beyond just radicchio that we could focus on like chris was saying so uh, we are really excited to uh to build off of the success uh that she's already had with radicchio and and see where this takes us so uh, lane thank you so much for participating today and i encourage everyone to go and look at her website um, follow her on instagram she's got a lot of great tv uh, igtv uh, uh, programs up as well and if there isn't any other announcements, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, let you all know that our next meeting is October 9th. Uh, we have a couple of different speakers lined up, so I'm not sure what, where the topic's gonna land just yet, um, but we're really excited to have you here. And just remember to follow um, our calendar and let us know if you have speaker ideas as well.